Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to AI for Good. My name is Bastian Kwas of the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, and it's my privilege to introduce today's webinar, Interpretable Neural Networks for Computer Vision, Clinical Decisions that are Computer-Aided, Not Automated, by Cynthia, Cynthia Rudin, Professor of Computer Science, Electrical and Computer Engineering, and Statistical Science at Duke University. As part of the Trustworthy AI series hosted by Wojciech Samek, head of the AI department at the Fraunhofer Heinrich Hertz Institute. For today's session, we're counting on your active participation for an engaging discussion. And for this, we'll be using the Q&A functionality, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. Additionally, there is a chat functionality, which you can use to communicate with um, other participants. ITU is the United Nations Specialized Agency for Information and Communication Technologies, and also the organizer of AI for Good, together with 38 UN sister agencies ACM and co-convened with Switzerland. Right now, I think it is time for me to hand it over to our host, Wojciech. Hi, Wojciech, how are you? Hi, hi, very good. So it's snowing now in Berlin. So it's really almost Christmas time here. Yeah, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Cynthia Rudin. Cynthia is a professor at Duke University, director of the Prediction Analysis Lab and Associate Director of the Statistical and Applied Mathematical Science Institute. Cynthia did very influential work in the field of interpretable machine learning. She received various awards, um, including the INFORMS Innovative Applications in Analytics Award, and was also named one of the top 40 under 40 in 2015. Yeah, so she also served on various committees for DARPA and uh, National Academy of Sciences, AAAI, and, and others. So I very much look forward uh, to your talk, Cynthia. And uh, yeah, let's, let's have the discussion afterwards, and the floor is yours. Thanks, Wojciech. All right, I'm going to share my screen here. There we go. OK. So we should be avoiding automated decisions as much as we possibly can for high stakes decisions. But that's hard because it means that humans and computers have to work together and understand each other. Uh, but computers don't always behave the way we want them to and it's not always easy to figure out what they're doing. Um, so let's see here. So this article over here is about air quality during the wildfires of 2018, okay? Now, this is a case where a black box was used. Um, Google replaced the Environmental Protection Agency's trustworthy air pollution model with a proprietary model from the company Brizometer, which told people it was safe to go outside on days when it was not. And um, that could have easily put people in danger. Whereas this article over here is about how FDA approved deep learning models for detecting intracranial hemorrhages are not performing well and no one knows why. So these are approved by our Food and Drug Administration and still they don't perform well in practice. Okay, now I'm, I'm gonna talk about medical decisions in this talk. And the one thing that anyone knows when we start to work with medical data is that it is really, really messy. And it's really easy for a machine learning model to get confused. And so I wanna introduce you to Clever Hans. Um, Hans is a horse. Hans really seemed to be quite clever. <laughs> um, he could answer questions like, if the eighth day of the month comes on a Tuesday, what is the date of the following Friday, right? <laughs> um, Hans would answer by tapping his hoof 11 times. And his owner had no idea how he was doing that. And nobody else had any idea how he was doing that. But um, as it turns out, Hans was simply looking at the level of stress in the owner's face. And then when the owner would relax, then Hans would stop tapping his hoof. And this is the kind of problem we do not want in medical imaging. We want an AI system to reason about an image in a way we could actually trust. We don't want it to look at like random things in the, in the X-ray. We want it to actually look at the medical content of the X-ray and reason about things in a way we can trust. Okay, so why is interpretability important all this, in, in all this? Um, interpretability helps you detect confounding like the clever Hans phenomenon where the answer was right, but for the wrong reason, because sometimes the answer can be wrong. <laughs> um, also, interpretability helps with high stakes decisions where a human really needs to know the reasoning process, um, like whether the patient should get a biopsy, right? That's a high stakes decision because um, it's surgery, right? Uh, interpretability helps you troubleshoot. So we, we want to know 
will this model work if I switch equipment? And if it's a black box machine learning model, I don't know. Will it work for all types of patients? If it's a black box, I don't know. Um, can I check if it's working on my current patient? If it's a black box, I don't know. And is the information that I fed into the system correct? And if it's a black box, I don't know. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, it's supposed to be the doctor's responsibility to make a good decision. But if you make, if you create these black box models and have them used in, in medical decision making, it actually takes away that the doctor's ability to kind of do their job. So the use of black box models in um, healthcare really makes all of these problems much worse. Um, you, if you use a black box, you actually take away the decision making ability of the doctor. So now it's the, the black box making the decision. And what we want here is for the computer to do what it does best, like crunch data to find patterns. And we want to preserve the human systems level way of thinking about problems. So as you can see, black box models turned computer aided decisions into automated decisions. So we want to turn that back. Now, a lot of people really like saliency maps. So this is kind of the most popular form of what's called explanation right now of, of deep neural networks. And I actually don't like them as an explanation because these, these types of explanations, they just tell you where the network is looking and they don't tell you what the network is doing with the pixels. So for instance, here, uh, the network is trying to explain to us why this image is a, has a Siberian Husky in it, okay? And so the network is, the explanation the network is giving is it's highlighting this part of the image. It's like, okay, great. So, so now we think we trust it, right? We, we think we might trust it because it's looking at the right part of the image, but you don't actually know what it's doing with those pixels. Because for instance, if I also ask the network, why does this image contain a transverse flute, then it gives me almost exactly the same explanation. So it's like, well, what did you do with those pixels? How did you get that? Uh, so anyway, um, I'm concerned that there's a lot of work in radiology right now on saliency maps. Like they think that this is enough of an explanation, but um, I actually think we can go much further than just figuring out where the network's looking. I think we should be able to give an explanation of what the network is actually doing with those pixels. All right, um, so as you can also probably tell, I'm not seeing that we actually need black box models for things. And um, so I finally, after like years and years of listening to people explain black boxes, mostly through saliency maps, I finally wrote a paper that was, you know, stop explaining black box machine learning models and use interpretable models instead. And what I advocated in this paper was that if you have tabular data, um, if you have just, you know, uh, features with categorical or real valued, um, you know, that kind of data, then I suggested to use decision trees or linear additive models or scoring systems, which are inherently interpretable. So no black box at all. And then for raw data, I suggested to use interpretable neural networks. So um, let me give you a little bit more, you know, let me explain why, why I'm suggesting this, okay? Let me explain why I suggested those things. So as I mentioned, there are really two kinds of problems, two main kinds of problems that we face in machine learning, okay? So there's problems with tabular data, which looks kind of like that. It's like real valued and categorical data. Uh, and then for, and then the other type of data we have are this, is raw data. So it's like images or sound waves or large amounts of text, right? These are very different types of problems. So here you already naturally have a good data representation and here you don't. Okay. So um, for the raw data problems, the only type of technique that's working right now is neural networks. That doesn't mean that's always going to be the way it is, but that's how it is right now. But also those types of problems, you have to think about interpretability differently. Like it just means something different than for tabular data. Like for tabular data, you could get a really tiny little model um, and, and that would be interpretable. Whereas for raw data, you have to think about, well, what does it mean for the network to actually explain what it's doing? So for tabular data, everything's different, right? With, with binary preprocessing for tabular data, all the methods tend to have similar performance. 
And so what that means is that you can even use really, really tiny models and still maintain accuracy compared to the black boxes. Like if you use um, a neural network on tabular data, you generally are not going to get anything for it as compared to doing some minor pre-processing. So it really kind of, um, you know, it really kind of opens the door, at least for tabular data, to design models that are very, very like tiny and interpretable. Um, so let me talk, before I get into talking about medical imaging, I want to give you an example on the tabular data side. Okay, and so that example is preventing brain damage in critically ill patients. So let's say that you have an aneurysm and it bursts. So you now have a, an explosion of blood in your brain. You have a hemorrhage and you go to the emergency room, get surgery. They put you in the intensive care unit and they put monitors all over your head. And those monitors are detecting for the possibility of a future, future seizure. Now, seizures are very common in critically ill patients. 20% of patients have them. Seizures lead to brain damage and they lead to death. And doctors will do a lot to try to reduce your chances of getting a seizure. They will even um, give you medication to maybe even shut part of your brain down so that your brain won't, won't damage itself. Um, and the seizures can be even worse than the original injury, okay? And the only way to detect seizure-like activity is with the EEG. Um, and this is problematic because there's only a limited number of EEG machines and physicians to read those machines. And so, um, we ha so what happens is that the machines tend to stay on people way too long and then people who need them don't get them. And it's really a problem. So, um, and like I said, so, so we have to allocate these monitors carefully because otherwise people who, who need them won't get them. So I worked with um, neurologists to design a machine learning model called the two helps to be score that is now widely used in hospitals and it's small enough that it can fit on a PowerPoint slide, but it's as accurate as our best black box machine learning models. So I'm going to just show you the whole model right here. So it's called two helps to be because it's two H E L P S and then two points for the B. So two helps to be. And then um, the doctors just add up the points and that translates into a risk of seizure in the next six hours. So um, this is the whole model. I, I know it looks just like a rule of thumb, but it wasn't created by doctors. It was created by data fit into a machine learning algorithm. It's actually a machine learning model. Um, it is just as accurate as black box models for our data set. Uh, as you can see here, we're using only six fact features, but the full data set had over 70 features. So the algorithm had to go in and pick which features to use and what point scores to use for them. And then it's not like a black box where doctors just have to trust it. Right here, doctors can decide themselves whether they want to trust it because they know exactly what calculation it's doing. And doctors can actually calibrate the score with information not in the database so that if there's, um, if, that you can explain um, to someone, the doctor can say like, oh, you know, this patient has some extra stuff about them that's not in the database. And I'm gonna add an extra point to that patient because this model doesn't include that information. And then also the score can be explained to non-physicians. So you can tell someone why their relative is being taken off of EEG monitoring, for instance. So as I mentioned, this model was created from a database of over 70 variables and the algorithm itself figured out which six variables um, to choose and what the point scores were. Now, so far, Two helps to be has been validated on an independent multi-center cohort. I was not involved in that study. That was just neurologists. And this is predicted probability of seizure versus true probability of seizure. And so being on this diagonal line is where we want to be. And the blue dots are from the initial study that we created the model from. And then the green dots are from this external study that was done on data from different hospitals. So it generalized nicely across um, across different institutions, which we were glad about. And so now it's been used in several different hospitals. And in the validation study, it resulted in a huge reduction in the duration of EEG monitoring. And so that allowed the doctors to monitor a lot more patients than they could before. In fact, they monitored 2.82 times more patients. And so according to the doctors, this helped them um, reduce brain damage and save lives. 
Now, the reason why we could use this model is because it's interpretable. People can understand it. All right, so it's a rare example of machine learning used in a very, very high stakes setting. Okay, so now I'm gonna sort of tackle this much harder question, which is what does interpretability actually mean for um, raw data? Like what, what is an interpretable neural network? You know, we know you have to use neural networks for this type of data. And we know that like, we can't use sparse models like we did for the tabular data. It doesn't make any sense, right? It wouldn't be interpretable to use just a few pixels in the image. You have to actually think about what interpretability means in this domain, right? Interpretability is domain dependent. So what I'm trying to do is create a new level of standard for interpretability in neural networks for radiology. So I'm going to um, discuss uh, a neural network that does case-based reasoning, and then I'm going to show you how we applied it to digital mammography. And we're, we're still in progress of that now. This is like a very long-term <laughs> project um, that started, I think, th three or four years ago. All right, so I'm just going to explain to you how this network works. This is this was just our attempt. Th this first part is just our attempt to um, have a network that is interpretable and does more than just saliency, right? Okay, so here's our network explaining to us why it thinks this bird is a clay colored sparrow. And I wanted the network to give us explanations that were either were every step is either something that's verifiable by a human visually or it is a linear model okay so that that's the criteria for interpretability here either a human has to be able to verify everything um, or it's a linear model okay so we have both steps here okay so anyway the network is saying i think this is a clay colored sparrow because this part of the bird up here looks like this part of that bird and this bird, I know this bird, this is a prototypical clay colored sparrow. It's in my training set. And I'm, you know, this is, this is a prototype, what a prototypical clay colored sparrow looks like. And I think, me, the network, I think this part of the bird, sort of the edge of the belly and the feathers there, that looks like this part of that bird. And this is a prototypical clay colored sparrow. And this part of uh, the bird looks like that part of this bird and this looks like that. And so this is actually how the network really reasons. And the prototypes are learned. All of this is learned. This is not chosen by a human. You know, what, what a prototype is, that's chosen by the network during training. And then the way these things are compared, that's all learned also during training. So we decided that since the network was doing all these comparisons, that, you know, it was saying this looks like that, and this looks like that, and this looks like that. We just called the paper, this looks like that, okay? Now, the way the network works is that it takes a, your favorite black box convolutional neural network and it adds a prototype layer to it just before the last fully connected layer to force the network to do case-based reasoning. So it forces the network to learn about or to, to reason about a case in terms of its relationship to past cases. And again, the prototypes are learned during training. So in other words, you take your favorite convolutional neural network and then you transform it to be interpretable by adding an extra layer before this last fully connected layer. And that layer forces the network to do these comparisons to these 20 prototypes. Um, and the, we, we use 20 prototypes here. That's a parameter that the user can set. The user, as I mentioned, does not have to pick prototypes. They just pick the number 20. Like how many prototypes do you want to use per class? And then the network scans the image looking for parts of the image that look like each of the prototypes. So I want to give you a lot more detail on how this whole computation works. So I'm going to write this computation in a different way on the next slide. OK, so here the network is explaining to us why this bird is classified as a red bellied woodpecker. So the network says, well, I think this bird, this part of this bird looks like this part of that bird. And I'm going to give it a similarity score of 6.499. And then this prototype is actually somewhat important as a prototype. And so I have an importance weight for that prototype, which is this 1.18. Okay. So again, this number tells you how similar this is to that. And this number tells you how important the prototype is. 
And this number, by the way, 6.499, that's a really high number. Um, the network is saying, you know, I really think this looks like that. And if you, if you look at it, it's like, yeah, it's got like a red head and it's got like the white and it's got like the little black spot and the little black underneath there. It's just, you know, it's really quite, these, these are really visually quite similar. Okay. And then it says, okay, and for this prototype, I think the feathers look similar to these guys' feathers. And so I'm going to give it a high similarity score for that. And then the importance of this bird to this class is this number here. So it does this 20 times, obviously leveraging the head as much as it can, because this is like a giveaway. <laughs> um, and then it takes all of the numbers it created, all 40 numbers, multiplies the first two columns together, and then you get points for each prototype comparison, add up the 20 numbers, and you get this over here. So now every computation so far has been either a human could verify that this looks like that, or it's linear. It's just multiplication and addition. That's it. And the network does this for all of the classes. So here's the second highest uh, class. And here um, it's trying to make comparisons to the prototypes, but it doesn't seem to be able to gather that many points. And I think it's because the red cockatoo woodpeckers don't have red heads. And so it just can't get as many points. And sometimes it gets it wrong. Uh, so here's a case where it got it wrong. And it misclassified this little cute bird as a prothonotary warbler instead of a Wilson's warbler. Um, it tried to tried to get as much evidence it could as it could for the Wilson's warbler class, like the eyes look similar to that of a Wilson's warbler, and maybe the feathers feathers, but um, the prothonotary warbler class ultimately won out. <laughs> and you can kind of see why uh, it really looks like a prothonotary warbler. <laughs> but as I mentioned, um, the Prototype network can be created from any base model, any black box convolutional neural network. And if you change the base model, it might get it right. So here it got it wrong for DenseNet 161, but for VGG, uh, it, VGG 16, it actually got it correct. And then you can see what happened if you look carefully. So here it's, it's figured out that it should do a comparison to the bird's eyes and its beak and the placement of all of that. But all of a sudden you realize like, hold on, wait a second. This bird doesn't look like a Wilson's warbler. Wilson's warblers have big black spots on the top of their heads, whereas our bird doesn't have that. And so I think what's happening is that our bird is a baby Wilson's warbler. And so um, it kind of looked like a prothonotary warbler. And so that's why it got messed up. Anyway, we've been testing our models on this bird data set, which is a benchmark data set in computer vision. And there are 200 classes of birds. The original black box accuracy is between these values. Try lots of different black boxes and get those values. And um, if we put, if we tr transform each of those black boxes into proto peanuts, then um, the accuracy is still in the same range. And if we stack them together, if we stack all these interpretable networks together, we get an accuracy that's better than any of these black boxes. And so, um, it, and it still yields an interpretable model because it's still reasoning about the image in terms of visual comparisons and just linear stuff after that. So um, yeah, so basically, um, even for computer vision, we can still have an interpretable model of the same accuracy as a black box. So I've yet to find a domain where I actually need a truly black box. So after we developed this, I mean, to be honest, I'll admit that I developed this because I was kind of sick of the deep learning people coming up to me and saying, well, I can't have um, an interpretable model for my domain. Like, that's not possible. And so I said, OK, well, let's try it. And so great. So proof of concept. We did it. Now I can at least talk to the computer vision people with my head held high. But then, then after we developed it, we were like, OK, well, what, what do we do with it now that we've got it? We can't just let it go. We can't just end with proof of concept. So we decided that we would um, try to use it for digital mammography. Um, so as you probably know, uh, breast cancer is a leading cause of death in the USA and in other places. Hundreds of thousands of cases diagnosed each year, at least in this country, um, causing tens of thousands of deaths each year. Mammography is also the hardest task in all of radiology. Radiologists miss a fifth of breast cancers. Half of women getting an annual mammogram over 10 years will have a false positive. Up to three quarters of biopsies come back as benign. In other words, these are potentially unnecessary surgeries. So it'd be really nice if we could make an impact in this domain, especially because, like I said, 
the hardest task of, in all of radiology. And radiology is, is right now being taken over by, by deep learning. And so we thought, let's get in there early and just let them know that they don't need a black box, okay? So we took our team and extended it to include some radiology friends. And so this is Dr. Lowe and Fides, who, who are helping us. Fides is a radiologist. Dr. Lowe is a professor of radiology. And Yin Hao is their student. And these are, these are my uh, students and former students, Chao Fan, Alina, Daniel. And um, when I met Joseph, he told me that, oh my goodness, you know, um, several AI algorithms have FDA approval for radiology. It's only going to be a matter of time before they unleash these black boxes, you know, onto the world. And we won't have any interpretability, even though we can get it without losing accuracy. And the problem, of course, is that, you know, if you run these models, they, as I showed you already, we know that they don't always work. We don't know, we don't know why they don't work is the problem. Now, I want to point out that not all radiology problems need interpretability. So the problem on the left is just lesion detection. So here you don't need interpretability because all the, all the model is doing is just checking whether there's a lesion in an image. And if there's no lesion in the image, the explanation is simply, I didn't find one, there's no lesion. So we don't need interpretability for this problem, but for this problem, we do. So this problem is very tricky, very difficult. Ra radiologists struggle with this problem all the time. It's should we order a biopsy for a known lesion, right? Is this lesion malignant or benign? And, and you know, is it, is it more than 2% likely to be malignant? If so, we can order a biopsy. Okay, so in this decision, we don't want to be automated. This is very, very tricky decision. You have to know a lot of physics and, and all that stuff to, under, to understand what's actually going on. Okay, so why is AI mammography hard? First of all, AI radiology is hard. As we know, FDA approved deep learning models are not performing well, and we don't know why. Mammography is just really, really hard, as I just told you. We didn't have any data. That's a problem. <laughs> Confounding is really an issue. Um, the model can be right for the wrong reasons, and that's really hard to deal with. And then we also wanted to know how to design a system that would actually be helpful. All the previous literature that we knew in the AI world was doing malignant versus benign detection. And that's actually not the right problem to solve. That doesn't help radiologists because they just need to know whether to order a biopsy. And as long as there's more than a 2% chance that it's malignant, they will order that biopsy. So we had to help them with the reasoning process and not just sort of tell them what to do. Okay, so the uninterpretable approach would be to just take the image of the lesion, which is here, and just send it into the black box. And the black box just says, oh, probability of malignancy is low. And I won't tell you why. Now, if you use the saliency approach, it'll say probability of malignancy is low. And here's why. And all it does is highlight the lesion. But I knew that was where the lesion was. That's why I sent it into the system. So that's telling me no information that I did not know before. This is not a useful explanation. Whereas our method tells you quite a lot of information that you might be able to use. So our method um, looks at parts of the lesion and compares them to prototypes of different mass margins and gives and adds certain numbers of points to the malignancy score. So here, for instance, um, the network is saying, well, I think this part of the image looks like this indistinct margin prototype. And so I'm gonna add half a point to the malignancy score because indistinct margins are bad. Whereas this part of the lesion looks like the circumscribed lesion. This is a prototype. And these, you know, these really do look alike. And so I'm going to subtract some amount from the malignancy score because circumscribed margins are good. OK, so um, as I mentioned, we had a serious problem with data availability for this project. Public data availability is abysmal. Um, the images are low quality. The equipment is outdated. The labeling is just a disaster. And then we found one really good data set we were excited about using. And then they wanted us to hand over IP for our model before we'd even created it. And so we said no. So luckily, um, I happen to have a collaborator who has an inside connection. This is not a way that we should be scaling things, but like this is the only way we could get access to data. So we got data from Duke. We got you know over 1,000 mammograms from 484 patients. And you might look at this and be like, what? 
This is tiny, but that's what we had. And if you break it down, it's even worse because these are the different types of mass margins and two of them are not able to be used. We had only 41 microlobulated ones, that's too small. And then these ones were obscured, which means they had to retake the picture. And so we couldn't really train it on that. So this was, this is pretty depressing, but we thought, okay, what is what we got, we're gonna try it. <laughs> and of course, who should show up immediately but Clever Hans. Um, so what it started doing was using information from the healthy tissue and comparing that to the prototypes, which is not good. But at least we successfully applied the technique, right? We knew that it was doing the wrong thing. Um, and we didn't lose any accuracy over the black box, which probably means the black box is looking at this wrong information as well, and it's confounded and whatever. But we found a solution that allowed us to get more information out of our data and prevent this from happening. Now, in particular, we decided to, and we decided to have radiologists annotate a few of the images, 37 images, paid a few thousand bucks and then had the radiologist just label these parts of the image and say what they saw and what information they were using to tell the network where to look. And so we generalized ProtoPNet to handle this kind of mixed labeling where we would get not only the regular label, which is you know what's in this image, but we'd also get this fine grained label. And then um, from there, when we retrained it, the network then now looks at the correct part of the image. And luckily we still didn't lose any accuracy when we trained it. So here we were actually looking at the right part of the image and, and maintained our accuracy compared to the black box. Okay, so um, now after training this thing, we have three mass margin classifiers, speculated, indistinct, circumscribed. And then we're doing a malignancy classifier at the end just so that we can see how we're doing. So I'm gonna give you a little bit more detail on this part of the network here. Um, so here, it's showing the whole reasoning process of why this is classified as circumscribed. So here's the lesion. Um, it highlights different parts of the lesion and says, oh, I think this looks like that, this part of that lesion. This is a prototype. The similarity score is four. And then it adds a certain amount of points to that circumscribed um, classifier. So, you know, it's not a black box with an explanation, right? If it's wrong, you know exactly what the points that it gave to each comparison were. So you can say, nope, this comparison's incorrect. I need to augment my data set this way and improve that particular comparison. So you can you can also troubleshoot it in real time. You know, maybe if you're a if you're a radiologist, I, I can't do it, but um, radiologists can they they actually tell us that it's actually, you know, actually providing a reasoning process that they can understand. And here's an example with the speculated margin class where it's saying, well, I think this looks like that, and I think this looks like that. And it, it, it's, very, it's very detailed and difficult to read, but this is something that the radiologists um, can do, and they can look at it, and they can judge whether or not its reasoning process is correct. Okay, so our results um, indicate that the performance is as good or better than uninterpretable techniques, but the uninterpretable techniques get to use confounding information, whereas we don't. All right, so uh, just to summarize, um, this is how we handled all of these challenges. The confounding we handled by annotating our data you know, more carefully with fine annotation, getting more information out of our current data set. Uh, the fact that we didn't have any data, we got it from Duke. As I mentioned, it would be much better if somebody would just put a publicly available data set of mammograms with good labeling on the internet. It's embarrassing for everyone that this data set doesn't exist. Um, and then the the fact that we were, you know, we don't we didn't want to just predict malignant versus benign um, allowed us to sort of decompose the problem in a way that would actually be um, aligned with the way radiologists reason about images. And it gives you an interpretable model for each part. And it does case based reasoning, which the radiologists are very familiar with, they often do case based reasoning when they're thinking about medical problems. And what we did not do is create a black box model and try to figure out what it was, what pixels it was looking at afterward. We did not do black box plus saliency. And we did not do malignant versus benign only because we know that that's not helpful for radiologists. Okay, so um, in the last, say, I think it's about 10 minutes, um, I'm gonna talk about another approach that we're working on. Um, this is uh, an approach for neural disentanglement 
which is um, what we're trying to do is uh, encourage the signal about a specific concept to travel through the network in um, through certain channels. Okay, so we know that there's no such thing. At, people talk about this like grandmother node, right? Grandmother node is the node that activates whenever your grandmother, whenever the network gets a picture of your grandmother. Um, but we know that, you know, yeah, okay, there might be a node that activates when your grandmother shows up, but also like a bunch of other nodes light up too. Um, here, what we want to do is focus all the information about your grandmother, if, if it's using that information, just to focus it through one node. So each, each, each um, there, there are specific nodes in the network that are concept nodes where information about that, all information the network's using about that concept go through that node. And we don't want to create a, we don't want to create a classifier for each concept. Rather, we would just like to have the information that the network is using about each concept travel through a specific path. Okay, it's, it's kind of like PCA for neural networks, right? You want all the information about one concept to kind of be aligned along an axis. Okay, so um, yeah, so CNNs, as you know, are not naturally disentangled. You don't have, you know, an airplane node, a car node, and a dog node. The information about airplane is sort of scattered through the network. The information about car also, right? And what people typically do is try to use concept vectors to disentangle it, which, which is post hoc and doesn't accomplish this. And just to repeat again, I don't want the network to classify airplane on the way of to classify airfield. That is not the goal here. Um, I just want to know if the network uses information about airplane to make its final decision. I just want to know how much information it's using. Okay, so yeah. All right, I just want it disentangled. All right. All right. So uh, as I mentioned. People often use, um, they, what they often do is they look at the latent space here. So you take maybe um, two neurons in, um, you know, a, after a batch norm layer, and you might plot the activations of the different, Im, different images on this axis. So this is like plotting in the latent space. So if network, if neuron one and neuron two both light up every time there's a bridge in the image, you would say the concept vector is toward this green blob over here. Okay, uh, and then, you know, for um, motorcycles, the network one lights up a whole lot, neuron two a little bit less, and so on. Okay, so that's what you'd like to be true. That's what, pe so that's why people are looking at these vectors. And the problem with this whole idea is that if you're doing this post hoc, um, these vectors are not naturally orthonormal. And so you can have two vectors for the same, for two totally different concepts going in the same direction. And you can also have concepts sort of blurred all over the latent space so that motorcycles are here and here and here and here and here and here. And so the concept vectors don't actually have any meaning. So um, what we did was we replaced um, the batch norm layer with a layer called concept whitening. And, um, Concept whitening forces the concepts to actually be along the axes, and it forces the latent space to be whitened and um, to be to be decorrelated and normalized. Okay, so it'll change the latent space so that it's decorrelated and normalized, like white noise, and align the concepts along the axes. And so you have one axis that's like airplane, and one axis that's like car. And so if the network is using information about airplane then we'll know exactly how much by looking at how much that neuron is activated. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna show a couple of slides next that look at images that are at the extremes of these axes, okay? So th these are images where the network thinks it's using the most information about airplane and where it's using the most information about bed or some other thing. Okay. So now when the network thinks it's using a lot of information about airplanes to classify, um, so at it, what you're going to see, okay, when, when CW is added to different layers, um, 
here's here's what you get for the airplane access. Okay, so when, when the network thinks it's using the most information about airplane, it's actually not using any information about airplane at all <laughs> because these images are not airplanes. But, right, this is only at the second layer. So the network doesn't can't really form like a true notion of what an airplane is. So it forms an abstract notion of what it is. And then the things that are the most activating on this node are blue backgrounds and white or gray objects in the middle. And that happens to be sea creatures. So that's the airplane, the, um, the airplane node gets really excited about fish and bugs at the second layer. Okay, so, um, so what information about airplane, um, you know, I mean, what, what do you really expect to get two layers in anyway? Okay, so it's kind of cool. So it just it just forces all the information it naturally uses about airplane to go through that one node. Okay, so it creates a primitive version of an airplane. And so let's let's look at what um, the the sort of most extreme version of bed is, and it seems to be like pink and orange colors. And then for person, it's like these stringy textures. It's really interesting, kind of what these abstract notions of these concepts are. And then if you look at the um, if you look at the later layers, it's not just color and texture information. You're actually seeing that the um, the axis, the things that activate it the most are actually airplanes. It's like, yep, I'm using lots of information about airplane to detect airfield here. OK. And I'm using lots of information about bed to detect bedrooms and so on. OK, so um, we decided to check out kind of how an image travels through the layers in this interesting new latent space with the concepts along the axes. And we chose an image that had neither a bed nor an airplane, but it was using information about bed and airplane to, to make its prediction. Okay, so take a look at this image. It's a orange sunset. And so um, it has, it, at the early layers, right, the network is like, oh, look, it's got a lot of bed information in it because it's orange. And it doesn't see any airplane information at all because it's not like blue with a gray <laughs> blob in the middle. So anyway, as this thing um, moves uh, along the layers of the network, it's less and less looking at the colors. And it's so it's less activating on the bed um, axis. And more and more starting to see that, oh wait, there's sky in this image. Sky gives us detail, you know, detail about airplane. So I'm gonna light up the airplane axis. It's actually using a lot of information about airplane now. And then, you know, oh, now it gets a little confused, not sure. It kind of moves around. And then eventually it says, you know something? I don't really know what this is, but it seems to have more airplane information than bed information. <laughs> it doesn't seem to be bed. Anyway, so the advantages of um, CW over batch norm are that we're not seeing any sacrifice in, sacrifice in accuracy. Um, the accuracy is on par with standard CNNs. It's actually really easy to train. You just um, start it from your pre-trained favorite deep neural network and just train it for one additional epoch. It does require some extra data because you have to define the axes by handing it like a bunch of pictures of airplanes for the airplane axis and a bunch of pictures of cars for the car axis and stuff. But it disentangles the latent space, which is super cool. Um, you know, maybe you could use it, for instance, to put all the information about race or something to go through one part of the network if you wanted to disentangle the network's race information from other information, but we haven't tried that. All right, so um, cool. What I've, what I've now shown is that I've, I've provided you two different types of techniques. The prototype network, which does case-based reasoning and fine annotation. This is strictly better than saliency because it doesn't tell you where, it doesn't just tell you where the network's looking. It tells you what the network is doing with those pixels. And it's completely faithful to what the model is actually doing because it's telling you what it's doing. And then I provided um, this new technique with concept whitening which does neural disentanglement. This is strictly better than concept vectors because the information that goes through those concept nodes is pure. Um, each node actually contains all the information about the concept um, that the network is using. And um, that information is all along the axes of the latent space. 
and it's all inherently interpretable. There's not, it's not post hoc analyses at all. So the takeaways are that there's no scientific evidence supporting a trade off between interpretability and accuracy in deep learning. Interpretability instead actually helps you troubleshoot and helps accuracy. And I'm actually quite concerned um, that it's only a matter of time until companies try to use black box models for biopsy decisions. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing that come in any day now, and I'm really concerned about it, which is why um, I'm giving this talk now and really hoping that companies will insist on a higher level of um, interpretability for their, um, for their radiology models, because I'm really concerned about what's going to happen when we launch these models that don't work and we don't know why. All right, uh, thank you very much. And here's a list of all the papers that I talked about. This is the um, proto peanut paper, the application to digital mammography. This is the please stop explaining paper. And then um, this is the concept whitening paper. And then this one is um, a review paper that we wrote recently in case you're interested in what we think are the big challenges in interpretable machine learning. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you very much. For this uh, interesting talk. Uh, do we have questions from the audience? So maybe I, I will start with one. Mm, so in, in your opinion, I mean, how does interpretability relate to trustworthiness? Is it like sufficient to have a interpretable model or is interpretability only like one part of uh, trustworthy uh, machine learning and if we want to if you want to make sure that our model is trustworthy because for example we want to certify it if we're in the role of F fda like what role interpretability can can play in this certification process so i think interpretability enables distrust <laughs> mm -hmm. i think it, it allows you to figure out whether you can trust it right because like otherwise you're left with like computing statistics um, and uh, the problem with those statistics is that you, you know, you're, you're assuming that your data set is unbiased. You're assuming, you know, you're assuming that the, the statistics actually work, but we know that data sets are really messy. Um, and so it's really quite useful to have a model you can understand so that you can actually assess whether it's, whether it's you know, reasoning in a way that you would trust. But is, is it sufficient? I mean, or no. like if, if we think about like, auditing process of, of a model, like what other criteria could be used in addition to, to interpretability? Well, uh, all, all the other ones, <laughs> you know, <laughs> robustness and so on and so forth. Um, I even gave you, a, I even gave you an example earlier where when we first trained our interpretable deep learning model on the um, mammography data set, it was looking in the wrong place. Yeah. And their interpretability allowed us to see that we could not trust the model. So yeah, it, it enabled us Distrust, <laughs> distrust. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we have a question from the audience. What could be the biggest challenge in interpretability according to your analysis? The biggest challenge or the hardest challenge? <laughs> okay. Maybe both. So the, well, I think I think to be to be honest, I think some of the most important challenges are for very sparse models, like sparse decision trees, I think is a major one. Um you know, just just sparse models, sparse logical models, sparse linear models. Um, so we have that written in our um, review papers. Those, I think that's an important challenge, practical challenge. Um, in terms of the hardest challenge, I think disentanglement is really hard, um, especially if you don't know what all the concepts are. So for concept whitening, we knew what all the concepts were. And so we, we were able to put them along the axes. But what happens if you don't know what the concepts are? Can you disentangle like the whole world? right? <laughs> How do you do that? Um, so that, that's a, a question that, that I think a lot of people are working on. Um, a lot of deep learning people are working on that. And I think it's um, that it would be, it, it's like, like a holy grail, you know, it's really hard. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Mm, what, what about adversarial attacks? I mean, if you have an interpretable model, is it more robust to adversarial attacks or does it have the same problem than a black box? Uh, I am not sure. Yeah, I, I, people have asked me about that before. I had a computer security per person get real excited about this and say, like, I think this is going to be more robust. And I was like, well, I don't know. Um, I think it's definitely easier to troubleshoot. You know, so if you if you um, 
if you see that that doesn't look like that, it's like, well, you know, we're going to troubleshoot that comparison there. Um, but I don't, I, I don't think that if you don't build any robustness um, into these things, I don't think they're going to be robust. So I think you, you have to do the same type of, of, of thing you would do to create a robust network, you know, you augment your data set, um, you know, all the stuff you would, that you would normally do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Do we have other questions? Maybe with respect to human like machine interaction. So like, in, especially in this medical settings. So it's really important that the medical expert, the doctor also understands the explanation because if it, at, at, at least I saw some work where people show that an explanation can also lead to false decision of, of false trust in, in a model output. So what do you think about that? I mean, how do can we improve like the whole system, like the human and the machine uh, interacting? Yeah, I mean, we're just about to do a, a study with radiologists on our, you know, on our on our interpretable neural networks to get them to grade the quality of the um, explanations. I think saliency has a major problem with that because um, in the example that I showed where it's just highlighting the dog's face, it's like, well, you know, I could, I could highlight part of an image and say like, oh, look, I'm looking here and that's why I think this is a blah. But if I don't tell you what I'm doing with those pixels, you know, if I give you such an incomplete explanation of what I'm doing, then I, I could see how it could be misleading. It's like, it's giving you some information, like you should trust me, but I, it's not enough information and I don't know whether to trust you. <laughs> yeah, so maybe the, the human expert makes up his own explanation from the explanation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we have a question from the audience. Are others embracing your ideas? So is it used in, in other uh, contexts? Um, I think so. It's, it's you know, um, it's hard to tell how, what, what exactly people are doing. I mean, sometimes, sometimes you, you never know um, where your code can end up. Um, so for instance, I know that many companies are using Bayesian role lists, which is, you know, for sparse linear, sparse uh, logical models, right? Um, and I know, so we posted code a long time ago for crime series detection when I was working with the police department. And um, I hadn't, I hadn't, I knew that the New York City Police Department had gotten a hold of this code and was using was playing with it, but I didn't realize that they had built it into a piece of software that they were actually using until five years after they had actually launched it. So you never really know um, what people are doing with um, code and so on. Uh, but if you don't put it out there, then people can't use it. Um, so that's why we try to make all of our code uh, public. And, and all of our papers publicly available. And w w would it make sense to, or have you thought about like extending your ideas to counterfactual explanations? So can you use also this ex types of explanations for explaining counterfactuals? Um, I'm not sure how to get the case-based reasoning stuff to, um, to do counterfactuals. Um, I find counterfactuals to be kind of confusing, to be honest. Um, if you have these very sparse models, then it's easier to do counterfactuals because you could say, well, in, if I went down this part of the tree instead, I would get this prediction, right? Or if I had this many points instead, uh, then I would be like, like if my two helps to B score was one more point, then, you know, I would get this treatment or something. But um, I, I think, it, it just gets to be kind of complicated, for example, for loan decisions. So let's say that you have um, you, your loan is denied and you want to know what you can do so that you would get your loan. OK, the, the problem is that there could be many different pathways for you to switch yourself from being denied to being to actually getting the loan. And all of those pathways have different costs associated with them. Like you could raise your salary by 30k a year or you could save 30k a year and all of these different things have different costs associated with them and eliciting those costs is much harder than any you know than actually making the predictions in the first place so that's why i haven't been 
working on counterfactual explanations because it's just it seems to me that the elicitation problem is so hard that um that i don't really know how to solve it i see i see yeah it's possible i mean it's possible that for the case-based reasoning someone could you know you could take take it and, and do it but but i just don't know how so we have a question do, do you foresee regulators embracing more robust interpretability methods like those you are developing? I wish they would. Unfortunately, things like right to an explanation um, are not sufficient because they just say that you need some explanation. They don't tell you how good the explanation needs to be. So for instance, every time my FICO score goes up or down, I get a note from one of these credit rating companies saying your score went up or your score went down. And these explanations make absolutely no sense. So I paid off, like I paid off my loan, right? I paid off a loan uh, a couple of years ago. My score went down. It's like, no, I, I paid off the loan. I should be more, you know, now I have more money that I can use, you know, yeah. I should be more credit worthy, but I am less credit worthy. And then they give me explanation about explanations about what I can do to make my credit score go up. And they're contradictory. So they're like, you don't owe money to enough people. And then they're like, uh, but you have uh, too many open accounts. So some ridiculous things that don't make any sense. It's like, well, if I do that, that's going to make that worse. If I do that, it's going to make the other one worse. So <laughs> right now, I'm not seeing regulators uh, uh, embracing this as much, nearly as much as they should, especially for problems like criminal justice, where these are this is people's freedom we're talking about. You know, it's whether they're free or not. It boils down to sometimes typos in black box models. And it's like, you know, we, this is, we really need to sort this out. <laughs> mm. So we have a question about this mammography example. I think you, you mentioned this, but maybe you can elaborate a bit more. Like why did you choose this mammography application? And for example, not other applications like cancer detection, pregnancy? Well, it is cancer detection, right? Mammography is cancer detection. Um, I, I chose this application uh, for a couple different reasons, but they were they were just personal reasons. I have a friend who had cancer, uh, you know, breast cancer. I also um, I had a connection to this this uh, this particular group. Um, I happened to you know I had a personal connection that I you know I've met these people and they were enthusiastic about this and you know, that this is what they wanted to do. They, the radiologist thought, you know, this is, this is where we should use this technique. Um, so yeah, that's, that's why we ended up doing it. Yeah. A lot of computer scientists fear the loss of accuracy of model with explainability. Can you overcome it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I wish, I mean, it doesn't seem to matter how many times I give this talk, people still think there's a trade-off between accuracy and interpretability. It's like ingrained in the way people think. Um, yeah. And I think it might have to do with this mystique in machine learning that black boxes are somehow picking up on signals that are so subtle and important that no human can understand them. And it's like, well, that might be true, but it could also be picking up on some crap in the, you know, the, the, that determines the type of equipment in the, you know, it's just looking at the noise of the x-ray equipment and, and you don't really want it to look at that. So, uh, you know, for me, the mistake is gone. I actually think models are a lot more elegant when they're when I can understand them, but that is not shared by by computer scientists broadly uh, and machine learning researchers broadly. Um, most most researchers think it's more elegant when they can't understand it. And so, yeah, they 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 actually they actually have a like a, a real distaste in their mouth when I say, oh, look, I have a model that I can understand. It makes them very upset. And it's too simple. <laughs> yeah, that it's, that it's, well, it's either too simple or it's, you know, but it couldn't be looking at that simple of a, it could be looking at that pattern. Like that pattern's obvious. It's gotta be looking at something deeper and, so that yeah, I can't yeah. understand it. You know, it's like, well. And can, can, can you apply this approach to like all types of, problems like I don't know like segmentation problems or, or, or all kinds of data like time series where you have some some temporal uh, domain or like reinforcement learning where you have this Atari games playing so can you possibly extend these ideas also to, to, to this kind of problems so for time series um, someone 
did a few years ago at KDD, I think maybe 2018, I'm not sure. Someone wrote a beautiful paper where they extended the case-based reasoning stuff to time series. Um, I was jealous. I was I watched their paper and I was like, wow, you guys, you guys are amazing. Um, I don't remember the names of the authors, but it was it was quite good. Um, can you extend it to uh, okay, so segmentation, I don't think you need to extend it to segmentation. So segmentation is one of those uh, areas where I don't think you need interpretability because the segmentations are usually checkable by a human. Um, so I don't, I don't see the need for interpretability there. In terms of reinforcement learning, I think that the case-based reasoning stuff could be, uh, could be used for reinforcement learning. I'm not sure about game, like Atari games in particular. Those are like, um, you know, those, those pro some of those problems are constructed so that you need to go very, very deep in the tree to figure out what the next step is. And, you know, they're, they're sort of constructed in a way that, um, uh, like, that it, it sort of is designed to be a problem where you need a super, super complex explanation, but those, those problems don't tend to occur in real life. Um, so they're, they're sort of designed to sort of thwart any kind of simpler explanations. I don't know. I don't work in reinforcement learning. Could, it could be. I don't know. <laughs> do, do we have any other last question from the audience? Like, I guess I feel like if you have to go to Atari games to find a problem where you, you have to sacrifice accuracy to get interpretability, then I've completely proven my point. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then maybe I have a last last one. Uh, I mean, many people are interested in using interpretations or explanations to gain new insights, like in scientific disciplines or could, when you analyze genetic data, when you maybe also in, in cancer re research. Do, do you think your approaches could give these kind of insights? So um, I'm working right now in material science, which is a field that I know almost nothing about. And I thought, oh, we definitely need deep learning for this because it's an image processing problem. It's looking at the, the patterns are so subtle that there's no, like humans don't have any understanding of what a unit cell in a material should look like in order to have certain material properties, right? But what we found is that we actually didn't even need deep learning. We were able to construct models that were inherently interpretable for, for even these very complex material science problems. Um, so I, I, do, I do believe that scientific discovery can be done in an interpretable way. And you know what we're planning to do is use these interpretable machine learning techniques to guide the discovery of new materials. So it's exactly a scientific discovery problem. OK, so Cynthia, thank you very much for this amazing talk. And yeah, hope to see you at some point in at the real conference. And yeah, have a have, have a good time. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Wojciech. And a big thanks also to our speaker, Cynthia Rodin, um, for today. We hope you enjoyed the webinar and we're launching a quick poll for you to, uh, to say so. So we have included helpful smiley faces that you can use. In the meantime, let me mention a few things that may be of interest. Um, we have on 14 December, the AI ML 5G grant challenge finale. Uh, so please join us then. We have posted the link in the chat and our next trustworthy AI session will be on 16 December, next Thursday at uh, 3 p.m. European time, featuring Andreas Holzinger, head of the Human Centered AI Lab at the Medische Universiteit Graz. Uh, the link is also in the chat. Please have a look. Uh, additionally, you can find all previous and future Trustworthy AI seminars on the YouTube playlist, of which we've also included the link in the chat. And finally, there is a link to our program. So please have a look for sessions on AI and climate, AI and health on Trustworthy AI, ML5G, and many others. With that, we've reached the end of the webinar for today. I'd like to once again thank everybody, our host, Mochik Samek, our speaker, Cynthia Arunin, uh, you, our participants, our partners, sponsors, and co-conveners Switzerland, and we hope to see you soon.